Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of the Sculpies podcast, where we contribute to the open discourse between healthcare, science, students, and the public with your host, Timothy Chu. Just a preface, I am simply a biochemistry graduate that is applying to medical school currently, so check in with your personal physician before making any decisions regarding your own health. I am not a governing authority on any topics, well, at least for the time being. Anyway, in this podcast, we have guest speaker Heather Askew, who is currently a nurse. We will be going over topics such as shadowing and volunteering, the perhaps less palatable aspects of medicine, Western chauvinism, why medicine doesn't actually save lives, multitasking, scope creep, and so much more. Please don't forget to like, comment, rate, subscribe, and share, and all that good stuff. It really helps the algorithm and will get the information out quicker. Regardless, hope you all enjoy. But before we go on to the rest of the podcast episode, we have to mention our sponsor for today, which is us, the Asclepius Podcast. Now, you can support this project not only by listening as you are already doing, following, hitting the like button, telling your friends, family, colleagues, loved ones all about this project as well, but you can also support us on our website. That's T-H-E-A-S-C-L-E-P-I-U-S podcast.myshopify.com. Com. Now, just a constant reminder, 10% of all proceeds from this project goes to Children's Hospital. But anyway, let's get you back to the episode because this one's a banger. Goodness gracious, do we have a good one in store for you future nurses out there. Well, also I guess there's a lot of good little nuggets for everyone else too, so I would highly recommend giving the rest of this episode a listen. Anyway, before I introduce our guest for today, I would like to talk about myself. You see, I have a pretty disproportionate head. Like my head is big relative to my body. I'm practically a bobblehead. And my friends and colleagues back in college and definitely in high school would most likely agree that this phenotypic expression is an outward manifestation of my inward personality, analogous to Henry V in Shakespeare, where he was deformed and grotesque to represent his inward faults. I mean, I, I guess to rephrase in a way that actually makes sense, I have a big head, which is fitting because I was a big-headed and cocky individual. Around that time, I had felt like the sail winds were behind me, pushing me along in life. And that all drastically changed when the medical school application process left me on red, ghosted me, and bounced my inflated head up against the wall to the point where it began to deflate. Those humbling set of events eventually provoked self-reflection, where, within the past couple months and years, I have drowned myself in philosophical literature and ideas from brilliant people up until the point where I became a hollow shell of the bobble-headed man I once was. And, within the meantime, I've been trying to build up my confidence once again. And that is the word that I would use to describe Heather. Not bobble-headed, but confidence. Just straight-up confidence. I mean, in an age where we can feel inundated with spectacle, whether it be in the guise of self-grandiosity or an artificial sense of humility, I find it extremely refreshing to find someone that is sure of who they are, what they can do, and has little more to add. It's sort of like sitting in a stable chair you know you can rely on, with no extra frills needed. Anyway, contrived and stupid introduction out of the way, Heather, how would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm Heather, obviously. <laughs> you just introduced that. But a um, little bit about me and my like career right now is originally after high school, um, I wanted to go into Chinese medicine and was starting to pursue college for that as to become a Chinese medical doctor. Um, did a lot of career counseling and got married and was still deciding if this is something I want to do because finances is a huge part of it. Uh, we, my husband and I are fortunate to live in a very diverse community. So it would be accepted on our community. However, I just didn't know, I don't know if it would be suited for me. Mm -hmm. And so I got a, a lot of career counseling with that. Actually, you can, 
your parents helped me <laughs> out with, <laughs> with that. Um, we're good friends. But with that being said, I decided to do my own research on more Western medicine rather than Eastern medicine mm-hmm. and decided to call a lot of nurses and medical professionals, doctors that I knew, and hear their experiences in the medical professional world today. Um, so with that being said, the nurses had great input, the doctors had great input, and I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I decided to volunteer at a uh, local hospital that was a level two trauma center, and they had a EMS concierge program where you greet the EMS coming into the ER, and mm. then you take them to the room and print out like paperwork for them. You help maintain like the cleanliness of the facility, just be a volunteer and a greeter and, you know, smile and say hello. Not that hard, but, you right. know, and while I was there, I really attached to the idea of wanting to be a nurse because these nurses saw it all. I saw how doctors and providers on one hand um, would bounce throughout the hospital depending on their specialty and land up in the ER if they're mm-hmm. on a different floor like a stroke unit or um, the critical care unit and then the ED docs just you know hey what's bringing you here today we're going to treat it and then you're going to go whereas I feel like the nurses got a little bit more social background and were able to be very communicative with them and kind of be whatever the patients and the community with the patient need. Mm. Um, so that kind of started that. You know, sometimes I think it can be super easy to be frustrated with all the requirements that medical schools and graduate programs can have regarding shadowing, volunteering, and well, just about everything else. But while going through the whole thing a second time, I totally understand why this would be a prerequisite. I feel like I've learned so much through my journey of shadowing and working in medicine before getting into medical school, and it seems that Heather here has as well. Also, this brings up yet another really cool topic about Western chauvinism within medicine and how our society can be easily dismissive of methods that are inherently difficult to statistically validate. I mean, I know that I feel embarrassed about my background as a South Korean male living in America, where I had all my family members sharing drugs because that particular drug worked for them, and perhaps sometimes causation and correlation get a little mixed up, and all of those things. But I also think that it's a great idea to just keep an open mind regarding this enigmatic pursuit of the thing we call truth. I think that there is inherent merit in pursuing truth from different perspectives and cultural backgrounds. And there are a lot of things from my personal family background that I think would be great in application with medicine. Things that are more towards preventative care. Ha, ah, this just reminds me of Sacrificium Intellectum. Corinthians 10.5, to remove all piety and prior knowledge. Just even language can be a significant biasing factor. Your syntax and vocabulary, I mean my goodness. All in all, I think this is less an encouragement for my viewers, but more of a little reminder for myself to just keep open-minded and understand that various perspectives are beautiful things. And honestly, if I don't like it, it's probably just because I'm interpreting it incorrectly. I have a history within the medical field. Like personally, my little brother is has special needs. And so growing up, we're always in and out of the doctor's office and still in nurses and providers. I mean, they're both amazing and helping us and providing us. My, uh, my dad has a history of cancer. So we saw that specialty, um, I have a history of depression, so I've had to go through and get counseling, and get help that way. So I've kind of always been involved in the medical field, but seeing this volunteer service firsthand is really what started my path into being like, nope, we're going to go ahead and do nursing. Yeah, and then that process into getting to nursing school, I decided to get, get my CNA license first and... Um, was a respite provider at the time to my little brother. And for those of you who don't know what a respite provider is, it's um, basically just somebody who comes in and is like a babysitter in a sense to people Mm. who have special needs to give care providers a break. And uh, the state or whatever um, 
I don't know, services pays you for it. You could do respite providers, CNA, community connectors. Community connectors is where you take them out in the community and teach them how to like grocery shop or how to ride the bus. Whereas respite providers in the home and doing like um, cares with them or um, taking them on a walk or something like that. So I took care of my brother as a respite provider while I was in CNA school. And then I got my CNA license and got a job at a local hospital here in Colorado and started to apply for nursing programs and finally got into one. And I graduate here in about ooh, three months. So I'm pretty excited. So the journey has been long, <laughs> but so exciting. we're almost there. Yeah. Man, oh man, is it so cool to see how those around us can ultimately shape up our trajectory through life. Also, I think it's so cool to hear how upfront Heather is about that tricky topic of mental health. I really do believe in the importance of acknowledging what society can view as constraints and working them into our lives and adapting them as opposed to expending all the energy to act like it's not there and continually keep it a hush-hush topic. Love it. There's a lot of shows, namely like Grey's Anatomy, mm -hmm. uh, House, The Good Doctor. And I think as a result, society has some preconceived notions of being a nurse. Mm -hmm. What's like the most common misconception you can think about when people think <laughs> of nurses? The most common one, I think it's just medical in general. Like whenever there's a flat line, when somebody's hooked up to a cardiac monitor mm. um, and they're like, the patient's dead, we need to go ahead and shock them and defibrillate them. Uh, you don't shock a dead heart. There's no electrical activity. Right. So sending an electrical impulse doesn't do anything. You're literally just cooking the heart and it's not going to do anything. Yeah, you got to do mechanical compressions and mm. you put a whole bunch of you know, a couple different medications in and hope it starts again. So that's the biggest misconception. However, um, in a scenario like that, what will happen depending on the facility that you're at, if you're on a unit, um, like a general medical unit, what happens is there's a couple codes that come into play before that. So you notice your patient isn't doing great. There's something called escalated huddles. A lot of facilities don't do this because it takes a lot of time and resources. However, you can call the provider, you can call a respiratory therapist, you can call um, other pr providers helping the patient and come together and be like, hey, they're not doing so hot. We need to change course of treatment because they may be headed down uh, towards the ICU if we don't do something. Hmm. A RT is called a rapid response unit. And this is where it's saying, hey, if we don't do something right now, they're going to code. And that's a little hmm. bit more escalated where as an escalated huddle can take like an hour for people to come to. RT usually takes about 15 minutes for people to show up. And then you have your code but in your code blue or um, that is necessarily where they're on the ground and they need compressions or they need respiratory help. And so I think medical shows don't show that at all. They are like go from zero to a hundred and it's like, well, what happened in, in between, right. you know? And so it's really important to know what's happening with your patient at all times because each intervention that you could do can prevent them from going to that road to the ICU with proper intervention and timing. You can like turn the treatment around and you can quickly head them home. Mm. So I think that's a huge misconception. I think also for nurses specifically, uh, you do a lot of grunt work. So you're wiping uh, rare ends, like you're helping these people. Right. <laughs> um, you're walking with them. You're doing a lot of physical exercise with them, like PT, OT. You're still doing respiratory treatments with them if respiratory is backed up. So you have education, like little bits of education in all of these different specialties. Um, and you're really basically the main spokesperson for this individual. So you go in, you assess them as a nurse, and then, uh, depending on how they're doing and what they're presenting, you can call the respiratory therapist, you can call the speech pathologist, you can call one of the main hospitalist providers, um, and kind of talk to them as well as social work and case management. So all of these people are tunneling into you to facil facilitate to this person. 
Mm. Um, and I'll, I don't think a lot of people know that. Has there ever been a moment in your nursing experience where you had to grit your teeth and you were like, my goodness, this is rough. <laughs> all the time, <laughs> all the time. Um, I always say nobody wants to wipe people's rear ends and deal with blood and deal mm. with sputum and deal with pus and deal with these smells and odors. Right. Nobody wants to be like, oh, I'm coming in today and I want to smell C. diff. I want to smell what that's like, or I want to smell, you know, units of blood coming out of somebody. Like right. those are very distinctive smell and you know the smell of iron versus the smell of the C. diff. And it, it, nobody wants that. And so that's really where you have to do some internalizing as to what's your purpose of continuing this career. It really does seem like a profound statement. You need to know your why. What is that pressure and force that is helping you overcome all the friction-saturated pursuits of medicine? All the smelly, stinky, uncomfortable, squishy parts that are either not shown on those infamous television shows or are wildly dulled given the current lack of smell vision and so for general medical units is what I'm on right now as a CNA. And you have somebody who's there for liver, liver failure to uh, a psych admission that needs constant supervision, um, sepsis, I mean, you to another total care patient. And as mm. a CNA, you can get up to the whole floor, which may be 24 patients that you have to get vitals on and help right. with. Whereas a nurse, each hospital is different for how many patient to nurse ratio you have. I work at a facility where they can only have four patients per every nurse, depending on their acuity. And their acuity is how sick they are. Right. So if they have a very high acuity, high acuity, they're very ill presenting, then uh, they may be in a two-to-one assignment or three-to-one assignment. Also, despite the fact that I love agency and individual grit and motivation, I also think that it's so cool that we have systems like that in place where it really just is an elementary equation of four patients to every provider just to make the system more streamlined. So I really personally like being busy and I like chaos and I like um, psych. That's where I feel like I make a big difference because you have immediate results. Mm. However, not everybody's like that. A lot of people like to be social with their patient, know the whole story so that they can better help them. And they like to see the long-term progression of sick to like healthy. I like to be mm. like, I personally like, you know, they were in psychosis and now they're not out of psychosis because we gave this medication mm. or um, they were in a certain arrhythmia and now they're not because of this. So I personally like immediate gratification in, <laughs> in right. my work. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just got to do some self reflecting to see why you want to do it in what your personality is like, because each floor has a different dynamic and yeah. I don't know. And that goes back into the question of what is your why, man? I mean, currently from this side, from our side, from the student's side, it seems like a super scary thing to think about. I mean, what's my personality? What are all the confounding variables that lead to the optimized pursuit? On one hand, for myself personally, I definitely have never felt as in awe as when I observed a heart transplant and that prior spine surgery. But at the same time, I also really loved the clinic side, just being able to sit down with patients and hear their stories about the ups and downs of their lives, slowly going over things and better educating them to increase the probability of them being medically compliant and making a choice that we believe to not only elongate their life, but also increase the quality in an average prima facie sort of way. Anyway, so why did you ultimately choose to pursue Western medicine versus Eastern? I feel in certain aspects, from what I know, which is very limited on Eastern medicine, so I don't want to offend anybody there, but there are certain practices that are very preventive and I am 100% behind that. And, mm. uh, and I feel like Eastern medicine has a very good grasp on preventing illnesses. However, with Western medicine is where you get um, these really life-saving medications and life-saving treatments like surgery. And mm. again, knowing me and instant gratification and wanting to see my patient go from not doing so good to, okay, we're 
on the journey to getting home. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's kind of where I sat in with that. And I mean, that's why surgery is so important too. Cause a lot of people are like, Oh, maybe I'll get it down the road. And it's like, well, if you can see somebody now, maybe you don't even need it down the road. Right. You know, if you could take care of yourself now, surgery may be off the table completely. And this reminds me of a recent conversation I had with my girlfriend who is currently deciding to go into child psychology. Now, I love medicine, and I think that there is nothing else for me. However, I have to concede that with regards to saving lives, people who pursue psychology like my girlfriend and my mother are way more effective than people like me who are pursuing medicine. Because let's be real, psychology and philosophy saves lives. Medicine prevents death. I also think in my little nascent view of medicine, I view that the deeper you get into medicine, the further you can get into this realm of saving lives. But to do so, it seems like the way you practice medicine would have to be very intentional because currently the system doesn't look like it's set up that way. Let me elaborate because I know that this little kid, not even a medical student at this point, is speaking a lot of big words. But I have been transiently attached to medicine, and this is what I have gotten to see so far. When I first started this podcast, initially it was just my curiosity getting the better of me. I wanted to know the difference between the two symbols of medicine that we use interchangeably, the rod of Caddisus and the rod of Asclepius. I had realized that the rod of Caddisus, from my superficial Wikipedia searching, represented negotiators and commerce, as well as thievery. And the reason why it was ultimately used as a symbol for medicine was because during the war, the medics would act as a neutral bystander attempting to heal both sides, to be that negotiator. And as a recent physician that I talked with said, healthcare and being a good physician has become less about who knows more and more about who has good bedside manner. It's become a business and service industry, and not necessarily a medicine industry. The rod of Asclepius, however, represents healing, just like straight up healing. And I realized that the rod of Caddisus represents what medicine has become, and the rod of Asclepius represents the medicine that I wish to pursue. Hence why this is called the Asclepius podcast and not the Caddisus podcast. The reason why I say that you have to be very intentional in pursuing medicine in a way that is conducive to healing and truly saving lives is because at its current state, medicine can really just seem like a conveyor belt of patients that are thrown pills and procedures until their numbers look good or their symptoms are no longer acute enough for us to further pursue any treatment. Then we just throw them to any other specialist that will take care of the other numbers that we aren't specialized for. And sure, Things like statin therapy, if you look at the pool of statistics based off of all the money these pharmaceutical companies get from directly marketing to patients, sort of that thievery side of the rod of catasis if you ask me, do show statistically significant increases in expected years of life. But is that truly helping anyone to really live? I mean, how often are things like anxiety and depression a comorbidity in our patient population? Also, I just want to state that I'm not blaming the system because ultimately I rarely think systems are put in place by some evil person rubbing their hands in a conniving manner. And I acknowledge that given the logistics and how predictable we are as people, statistics does seem like the most logical and most efficient manner in order to implement nationwide healthcare. But with that also being said, I don't believe that the system dictates or should dictate the quality and character of the care you can provide to your patients because I have seen time and time again amazing physicians that I work with who fight against the system in their own little ways and go above and beyond to truly battle in the arena of saving lives, of embodying the type of medicine I wish to pursue. Phew. What a Timmy tangent. Now, I would also like to state that yes, I might be talking out of my butt because I mean, what do I know, right? But if my conception of medicine and healthcare is currently accurate up until this point, then that would be my current stance on the matter. And if it is completely off or completely naive, well, this is why this is a student-led podcast and I am more than up to be educated by future guests or listeners. I love learning if you didn't notice by now. Have you ever felt like a time where you were struggling with patients and how did you sort of grow from that if you did? We, we have a lot of eating disorder um, individuals on our unit. Mm. And so they'll get admitted because their heart rate is so low. And I think the lowest I've seen is like almost, I think 19 beats per minute, which is insanely low. Mm. And 
you'll go in there and you touch them and they'll wake up right away and then they fall back asleep and it's like 19 beats per minute. And so we need to like slowly restore them to a healthy heart rate so they don't get refeeding syndrome. And so their electrolytes won't be imbalanced and just all these different things. But those individuals, a lot of times, um, when we're helping restore their weight and their cardiac cycle and stuff, um, they could be very one minded because they've had this control around food. And it's really easy to go in there with their perception of being like, it's just another patient. And you need to hurry up and eat and you need to hurry up and do this because I have X, Y, and Z to do instead mm -hmm. of being, um, instead of sitting with them and taking your time and realizing that this could be somebody's worst day of their life in this facility and right. me being standoffish and in a rush is not going to better fit, benefit them. And if I was the end point, the, the other person receiving the care I'm giving, would I be satisfied with this care? Right. You know, it's taking that self reflection again and being like, wow, I need to just slow down. I need to take a deep breath and be in the moment with this patient. And that also is where time management comes in. Cause if you have somebody else who's, uh, getting sicker and sicker and needs that escalated huddle or needs some intervention, it's kind of hard to balance the two, but you kind of learn that as you go and continue working in the, in the field. Increasing the resolution that you live your life and being in the moment. This reminds me of a recent big wake up call. As some of you may know, I'm currently applying to a research lab and have been volunteering for the past month while also working in the clinic and developing this project called the Asclepius Podcast. As a result, I thought it would be great if I tried to multitask and this is where it led me. I was doing a procedure while listening to a podcast episode I was trying to ultimately edit and work on further, and everything was going great until at the fourth to last step, I zoned out and didn't know if I had used an eluding buffer, which would have resulted in me throwing away my product down the sink. This product, mind you, was something that I spent the last six hours trying to create. Now, I recovered and redid the experiment, but I was very upset and frustrated with myself. So... I began doing what I do best. I took a step back from my life and immediately went to Google Scholar to search up articles on multitasking, which led me to a paper called The Myths of Multitasking. In the paper, I quote, and I quote this from memory because it's committed to memory, there is time enough for everything in the course of the day if you do but one thing at once. But there is not enough time in the year if you will do two things at a time. The steady and undissipated attention to one object is a sure mark of superior genius, as hurry, bustle, and agitation are the never-failing symptoms of a weak and frivolous mind. Like, damn, what a call-out, right? In my recent conversation with Servando on our Patreon-exclusive episode zero, I believe, Servando and I talked about the abstraction that can occur when you zone out, when you dissociate patients from people. And I think it's such a crazy thing analogous to Sisyphus, the poor lad that was cursed by Zeus to push up a boulder every day up a hill just for it to roll down and for him to start again the very next day. Similarly, every day, we need to live a high-resolution life and not zone out especially when we're in a field that deals with people. Continuing on the negatives or maybe like the difficulties of the position, I understand that COVID all slapped us and I was wondering how maybe COVID changed the way you work. Luckily at my facility, we had a very big supply of supplies that we needed mm. and it didn't really change so much. I mean, a couple of little things changed about how often we're like wearing and switching a mask and our non rebreathers But for the most part, it was pretty fluid. I feel like our facility did a very good job. Um, the, the big difference that I can see that's really hard now is the whole mask thing, like being able to communicate with somebody like mm -hmm. your eyes can talk, but like the movement of your mouth helps people so much receive the information that you're trying to give. And it's been very hard to effectively communicate even with this like shield. Cause if I'm right. talking to you like this, like you could tell my voice is muffled and you know, just the little movements of your mouth make such a big difference. And so I've noticed, uh, with the population I work with, there's been a lot of miscommunications 
that have arised from it. And so it's really important with how we choose our words because half of our face isn't even being seen. So they can't even receive, you know, communications. I'm not going to lie. Initially, I've seen some people wearing these clear masks and thought they looked absolutely ridiculous. I also thought that it was something done out of vanity where people just really wanted to show all the parts of their face or something. But as I've been interacting with more hard of hearing or deaf patients, I realized how convenient and comforting it is for people to be able to have that added sensory input of seeing someone's lips move. So for all you rocking those clear masks, you do you and don't mind the unimaginable and mean people out there such as myself speaking about words we've interacted before um i guess not never in a setting like this but we've interacted before a lot because you are friends mm -hmm. with my uh parents and stuff mm -hmm. and i would say that your vocabulary has significantly changed after being in th this field oh yeah and i think that that's always the most interesting telltale sign of someone getting involved in a profession, which is that your whole vocabulary, your vernacular, the way that you talk, the way that you're thinking completely shifts as a result. From developing a different way of speaking, have you also found a different way of thinking? Do you always think about these things? How has this career shifted your makeup, I guess? That's a great question. I think, I think now it's really hard to have a genuine connection with somebody because you're constantly assessing them. <laughs> you're oh. taught in school to assess nonstop, you know, nonverbal cues, verbal cues, you know, their fingernails, are they bulging? Are they not? What's their skin texture? You know, like, what does their throat look like? Is it pushed to one side or not? What about their hair? Yada, da, da, da. And mm. so it's really easy when you're first introduced to somebody to treat them like, like a, a subject because you're assessing them and it's really easy of course to do that because for myself I maybe have one day off a week that I'm not doing something that's a medical professional development I'm either working and or in school or doing clinicals and so that one week off I'm usually sleeping so I'm constantly mm -hmm. in this mindset of assessing and being there for medically there for somebody. So that's been really challenging for me. And it's really important to know what hat I'm wearing at the time of day that I'm at. Mm. So if I'm at work, then yeah, it's okay to assess. If I'm at school, it's okay to receive information. You know, if I'm meeting somebody for the first time, it's okay to just meet them and have great eye contact with them and not even assess them, you know, right. And so that's been very, very challenging. And that may never go away talking to other nurses. They're like, you'll notice stuff and be like, that's not normal. Like, um, <laughs> what is it? The basketball player. Uh, who is that? MJ? Michael Jordan. Yeah, Michael Jordan. When he did his interview um, that came out during COVID, he had like certain segments that came out every week. Oh, and he, he kept on saying he took it personal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you look at his eyes, this is just me, but I was like, his eyes, like his sclera has a weird color to them. Like they're and, like you know, off-white. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that could be too. like indicative of liver, like something going mm. on with his liver. And so, um, you know, it's like you can't just sit there and enjoy things for what they are now. You're always like looking at the body and what it's presenting. Right. So, yeah, it's um, it's hard to turn that off and turn it off. Turn it on. Oh man, the amount of times I have diagnosed people with Marfans while they're walking down the street, completely unaware of the little psychopath that is sitting in their car at the red light checking off phenotypic expression. Anyway, that's a cool little thing that I am realizing myself as well. Sharing information should be a consensual process because it involves at least two parties. I have found myself so many times going down these long-winded tangents about some crazy science or medicine thing that I recently read, only to realize the horrible consequences of my action as I see my girlfriend's eyes completely glazed over. I then snap my girlfriend out of her catatonic state and apologize profusely as we start talking about more consensual things such as food and our little pet cat and whatever. Ah, consent. 
Amazing. It's very hard. And a lot of people come to you for medical advice. And it's like, I haven't taken the national exam to become a registered right. nurse yet. So I cannot give you sound advice. And that's not my scope of practice. I'm not qualified to give you that advice. You know, like I have somebody telling me what to do and then I'm the hands of that person. So they're like, hey, you need to start this medication. You need to do this and that. And I do it. But I'm not qualified to make that call. So, um, yeah, it's really hard to tell people like I can't I can't do that. (laughs) Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? Not really. I think you you're taught your limitations and are like you, you hear your limitations from different roles of what you can and can't do Mm. (laughs) constantly. It's written out. You go into work knowing it. You're in school knowing that you're not licensed yet and that you have to have a clinical scholar with you because I mean, you're learning these things. So it's really easy to know what your boundaries are. And for me at my school where I'm at, I think they're very receptive to questions and appreciate people questioning um, themselves and being like, I don't know if I have the knowledge for this or can you help me with this or can we Mm. schedule a time to study more on this? So I don't, I wouldn't say that I've experienced that. There's been a lot of times where I have to bring myself down and just be like, that's not my scope of practice Mm. though. And be like, that's just not my scope of practice. So, and it's especially hard being a CNA in nursing, like uh, a CNA at a hospital and continuing your nursing degree because you have all this information and you want to use it, but you're not licensed and that's a hundred percent illegal. And you have to, again, put the right hat on and be like, I am a CNA. I'm not a nursing student and I'm not licensed. So I can't even do it and just right. like, no, outside my scope of practice. So I mean, it goes both ways, but I think, again, it's just that self-reflection. Like, are you comfortable enough with yourself to know your limitations, to know your um, what you're qualified for and not qualified for, what you're confident in and not confident in? Um, are you comfortable to ask questions? Are you comfortable to go to somebody you don't know that's not maybe a peer, but somebody floating to your floor and be like, I've never done this. Do you think you have time to help me? Um, Yeah. Oh, snap. We are touching upon a huge topic that I knew would eventually find its way on the podcast. Scope, creep, and medicine. Now, in medicine, there are a lot of levels to this game, but instead of being these discrete quanta of information, it seems like a little bit more of a softer gradient. I've had some physicians tell me that anything regarding procedures or the medications should ultimately go through the physician. And at the same time, I've also heard plenty of physicians ask me, hey, do you know about the procedure? Do you know about the medication? Then just tell the patient. Of course, my scope of understanding is far more limited as I am just a humble medical assistant that has a biochemistry degree and has only read 30 pages of the USMLE Step 1 book for fun. But what about the other providers? physician's assistants, nurses, nurse practitioners. Well, it seems like that confidence that Heather is talking about does come with a lot of questions initially and a lot of time. Just from my little role, I have realized that the amount of questions I ask the providers is inversely related to the time spent at the position. The more I spend time working, the more I realize what niche of medicine I snugly fit. Yeah, I, uh, my, one of my deans, my associate dean, I think it was like, one our first or second quarter in nursing school and she she came in and she was like if you guys don't have your social life figured out it will impact nursing in a negative way because you can't control yourself so how are you able to help somebody else essentially essentially mm. and that really helped a lot that truly helped a lot because um, when you're dealing with sick people, I mean, they're not the nicest, right? Like if you're in pain, are you going to be like, <laughs> like please, please take how much time you want. Right. I don't even care. <laughs> and then, you know, it's not going to happen. You're in pain. You're like crying of it. You're an adult and you're crying. It's yeah. embarrassing. You have all these different cultural beliefs associated with it and how you're raised to deal with pain. Um, 
And so that could bring like a lot of uh, dessert, like, mm, that's not the right word. It can bring like a, like a rapid flush of like negativity to you as a, a, as a nurse. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you don't know how to process your emotions, all I have to say is just to just go see a therapist and just talk about stuff because mm -hmm. stuff comes out and learning how to be emotionally intelligent is so important in the profession. And again, it's, it is so important to pick up little social cues and how to respond appropriately to that and know when things are personable and when it needs to be escalated, if it's a threat, if it's not a threat and just understanding these things. So, I mean, mm -hmm. all I can say is self reflect constantly and know your scope of practice. <laughs> that is such an interesting thing. How our life experiences precipitates into who we are and what actions we are most likely to follow. In an instant, our brain has made that snapshot and has tried its best to abstract and reduce the person in front of us to a set of more manageable variables. For instance, are they agreeable? Do they seem educated? What's their socioeconomic status? How am I coming off to the patient at this very moment? Where do I need to concede in this interaction in order to provide the best care? It's such a crazy, complicated Thing. And despite all the numbers and logic we can find ourselves hiding behind, it's cool or perhaps daunting to know that there is a limit to logic when faced with the human condition. That sample size of one. I guess as Heather was saying, it might be best to look at yourself, look inwardly to further explore that quote unquote human condition. I was wondering if you could talk about maybe one of the most gratifying smile from ear to ear moments that you can think of with your profession where you were like, that's a memory that lives rent free in my head. Ooh, that's a good one. I'm stumped because a lot of times, you know, these people are sick and so it's more rehabilitating them mm. and with the floor that i'm at and working nights you don't ever discharge patients usually and so i don't really see that moment where they're leaving um mm. i don't know i think overall i just think medicine is so cool and the technology that we have that i'm so grateful to be learning this and being able to be the person that will provide this care one day. I'm so happy that I'm blessed with this opportunity to do that. And so a lot of people nursing school and studying to be a doctor, oh my gosh, it's so, so annoying because it's nonstop, right? And it's, <laughs> it's horrible. There's times where you're pulling 24 hour days just because you're going to, from work to school and then back to work. And mm. it, it's very, very challenging, but taking it in and even though you're paying X amount of money for it, like one day I get to use this and change somebody's life. Like mm. that's a gift and right. just humbling yourself. Like every time that brings a smile to my face, just going to school and learning this. Cause at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, I wouldn't have known this, you know, like it's just so interesting and so cool to me. And, um, yeah, I mean, patients also come from so various backgrounds and so interesting to learn about different cultures and different beliefs. Mm. And, um, you know, what's acceptable to them as far as medical treatment and not because, you know, my, my horizon of knowledge is expanding. And I just think that's so, that's such a blessing overall. And yeah, some of the patients, they leave very impressionable moments on your heart. And, um, you know, it's always nice to see some patients, um, I have some adolescent patients that have been taking custody away from parents and have been placed in great foster homes. And those always touch my heart to see that, you know, this individual who didn't even know this patient wants to help them and foster wow. them, not just in this setting, in the medical setting, but life skills and take care of their medical needs. You know, mm. like that's always so touching to hear those stories. Looking back, if you could see baby Heather before <laughs> she's going mm -hmm. into nursing school or pursuing this field, what would be some like words you would tell? Mm. That's a good one, Timothy. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> I'm just loaded with questions. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Enjoy the moment. Mm. Enjoy floating. Enjoy learning that spine surgery that you absolutely did not like. <laughs> it's a <laughs> once in a lifetime thing. You'll learn what you like and don't like. Like, 
enjoy learning essentially enjoy learning. again i don't know because there's a in nursing school there's a lot of bickering and there's <laughs> it's just oh we have another assignment oh we have this and that oh, oh, oh. Right? right like you get that a lot of times and so just enjoying the learning process i think would help so much and actually taking the time to study um have you heard the the bill wither song lovely day maybe maybe i'm really bad at associating names with okay songs. so it, it's just a song that says it's a lovely day like over and over and over again oh. and for any of you guys interested in nursing go follow nurse blank on instagram and he makes like <laughs> some funny some funny tiktoks and uh reels about being a nurse and makes fun of them and pokes at them and he has one mm -hmm. where it's like i'm gonna go into my shift and don't complain and he just had a smile on his face the whole time because it's so easy to complain being asked to do this this and that because again you're doing the cares you're not telling people to do them you're doing them yourself and mm -hmm. it can get frustrating sometimes and so having that perspective of it's a lovely day and enjoy the moment changes, changes everything. You're mm -hmm. so grateful for it. And you're just like, this is what I signed up for. Like, it's fine. Everything's going to be okay. I get to go home at night. I don't know. Let's awesome. enjoy it. Do you have any words of advice, encouragement, or maybe harsh words for our listeners who are, might mm -hmm. be pursuing these fields? Just go ahead and research what you want to do. If you can volunteer, um, you volunteered, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere. Um, Do you yeah, still I'm volunteer? Yeah, I'm volunteering. Yeah. You see a lot of different practices and it helps you know what's false and what's true about the practice. Cause you have this like made up connotation of what these people do and actually going and seeing it is a completely different thing. Mm. Um, I would say definitely go and volunteer, ask people in the profession to see what their thoughts are of it. And I mean, you have job security for the rest of your life as a nurse, and you have so many different avenues. Like a lot of people don't know with nursing, you could be like a high school nurse. You can go ahead and continue your education and be a nurse practitioner, which is where you can be a nurse and give those orders out and can diagnose and treat. Um, you could be a community health nurse and work with um, like mobile birth control units um like there's so many different avenues you could be a parish nurse you could be a nurse for a um a religious organization you could be an outpatient nurse you could be a surgical nurse there's so many different options it's so cool to know that you know you have a job with whatever moment you are in life. If you need something fast paced, like me and instant gratification, you have, <laughs> you have hospitals for that, I guess you can say, mm -hmm. if you really want, um, some psych related nursing, you could go ahead and do outpatient nursing. Like there's so many different things like outpatient, um, counseling, which is really cool. And so you always have a job, but go and see if it's, really for you and go get some therapy because we all need it. <laughs> <laughs> it it helps a lot understanding yourself yeah. and understanding how you think and understanding your emotions and how you process things because i think for me understanding myself has really helped me to be able to one know my limitations and to essentially be a good i don't know be a good provider because mm -hmm. I don't have anything stopping me internally from providing care to somebody. And I think a lot of times we go in and we don't know what those are for ourselves. And you'll see a really bad case and it sparks something that you completely forgot about or you acted a certain way. And you're like, why did I do that? And so understanding yourself really, really helps a lot. Oh, my goodness. And it helps you be professional in so many cases. So. Mm -hmm yeah damn being at peace with yourself to better help others it's analogous to that thing where you're on an airplane and they instruct you to put the mask on with oxygen for yourself first before putting it on your little children or the people around you i just love it anyway in conclusion we learned about how shadowing and volunteering can be used to actually learn about a field as opposed to simply being a prerequisite 
We learned about knowing your why to help you push through all the doo-doo of medicine, being confident and understanding where you place on the totem pole and avoiding scope creep, censoring that part of your brain that diagnoses everyone that comes across your way, and we got to do all of that while also remembering to really look into ourselves. Thank you all for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, hit the like button, comment, subscribe, rate. It really helps. If you didn't enjoy the podcast or you feel like some constructive feedback is warranted, please also comment below. Anyway, this is the Asclepius Podcast with your host, Timothy Jew. The next episode will be a special episode. So I have absolutely no idea what I'm cooking up for you because that's technically the last episode I do. So yeah, adios. Mm-hmm.